so let's go ahead and get started. Um, I am very, very pleased this morning to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Miles Wolf. Um, I think uh, we have talked on several occasions about the fact that cardiovascular disease is the major cause of morbidity and mortality in the population of chronic kidney disease and end-stage kidney disease patients. And Dr. Wolf has been a leader in the investigation of the hormone FGF23, which we now know plays a critical role in producing some of the cardiovascular complications of uh, kidney disease, as well as has a role in phosphate metabolism, iron metabolism, and the inflammatory state that is seen with chronic kidney disease. Uh, Miles is the division chief um, professor of medicine at uh, Duke University. He has a very active research program in mineral metabolism uh, there, and what he lists as his most significant accomplishment is that he has trained six individuals who are now independent R01-funded investigators, three clinician scientists who are doing clinical research, and three basic scientists um, who are doing basic science research um, in the field. And that is, uh, I think, gives you an idea of the breadth of this person's knowledge base and skills. So with that, um, I'm going to ask Miles to come to the podium Great. and deliver the talk FGF23 at the intersection of kidney and cardiovascular disease. Thanks, Miles. Thanks, Eleanor, for the great introduction. Uh, I like the wrinkle on the speaker's accomplishments. I especially like getting asked in on the car ride over at 7.30 in the morning pre-coffee. So that was the best I could do. Um, well, thanks for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. I've never been to the University of Louisville, and I'm going to take you through uh, uh, this very interesting tale of a uh, hormone that regulates phosphate and vitamin D homeostasis that ultimately then interfaces very unexpectedly with iron metabolism. And the hope here is to go a little deep on some kidney and physiology and endocrine concepts, but then also to see how that has relevance to a general medical population. Uh, and later when we talk about this iron business, I think there's relevance for people across the spectrum of medicine. So first, a disclosure, uh, some consulting for, for companies listed here. Let me start with a case. This is the, the mandate of how it's done at Duke for Grand Rounds, and I've adopted it, and it works well for this presentation. This is a colleague of mine in Europe who saw this patient who he'd been taking care of for many years with very severe Crohn's disease that was difficult to control. He was on all kinds of uh, immunological therapies. He had had multiple surgeries. And despite that, he suffered from ongoing blood loss from ulcerations uh, at anastomoses and, and, and elsewhere. And he came in with a bilateral waddling gait and, gro excuse me, bilateral groin pain and a waddling gait. And uh, this plain film was taken in if you've been straining your eyes while I've been speaking, it's completely negative. There's nothing to see. Um, but somebody there suggested, let's get an MR. And this revealed something very sinister. What this patient has is not one, but two bilateral fractures of a very specific type. This is not the head of the femur aseptic necrosis, which would be up here. This is not an osteoporosis fracture, which would be in the neck of the femur. This is at the point of maximal stress on the bone in an upright individual. And it runs perpendicular to the plane of that stress. This is a classic fracture that you can't see on plane film, but shows up here. This is a fracture of osteomalacia. It's got a name, uh, looser zones, it's also called. Um, but it's basically a fracture of unmineralized osteoid. And so, Ortho was called, and Ortho came and does what Ortho does. They hammered in big nails, stabilized the, both hips, and sent the patient on his way. And a month later, he came back, now unable to walk. And this one you should be able to see on plain film. This corner is supposed to be opposed with this corner. So he has used the screws in his left hip as a fulcrum to now snap the neck of the femur. This is a real problem. 
So what is wrong with this poor man? We'll come back to that, hold that thought. So here's what I do. Uh, a lot of people in nephrology research focus on what causes kidney disease. Why do people get focal segmented glomerular sclerosis, membranous, diabetic nephropathy, et cetera? But I have not focused there. I've been more interested, as Eleanor introduced, in why people with all kinds of kidney disease, almost completely independent of the underlying cause, why they end up developing so much cardiovascular disease. And we've put a specific emphasis on this hormone, FGF23, that I'm going to introduce you to. So the story starts in the late 1990s. This is a seminal paper here with a very low resolution graphic that I should tease the author, Jeff Block, about. But what he showed for the first time in the late 90s was that higher serum phosphate was a risk factor for mortality in patients receiving dialysis. And so once you get to phosphates that are over six and a half, you start to see a significant, it's not an enormous effect in fairness, but you see a significant increase in risk of mortality. Well, this has subsequently been replicated in enormous 50,000 plus patient cohorts where you see this graded increase in risk, the higher serum phosphate above a certain level, the higher risk of mortality. It's been replicated in people, this is VA data, who are pre-dialysis, that is, Virtually all of these patients, as I'll show you in a minute, have normal serum phosphate, yet within the normal range, high normal does worse than low normal. And then I think the only time in the history of clinical research where nephrologists found something that then the cardiologists copied in the Framingham Heart Study versus the other way around, they went and looked in the Framingham Offspring Study and found the same thing. Higher serum phosphate today, higher future risk of cardiovascular events in a non-kidney population. And so let's talk a little bit about phosphate handling in the nephron. Um, fortunately, this is not a talk about calcium, because if we were going to talk about calcium, we'd have to stop at every nephron segment where something different and complicated is happening. When it comes to phosphate, it's much more straightforward. The whole entire action is at the proximal tubule. And so phosphate is freely filtered, by and large. And then it faces the brush border of the proximal tubular cell. And it is either reabsorbed via this channel or this channel, NAPI2A or NAPI2C. And they bring filtered phosphate back into the cell, and then it's put back into the blood compartment. What this means then is, is that any phosphate that is not reabsorbed at this site passes by the proximal tubule and it's gone. There's no other avenue for it to come back. It ends up in the urine. So the entire regulation of phosphate and its excretion Lar uh, largely relies on the activity of these channels, which are in turn influenced by the hormones that regulate phosphate homeostasis. PTH, although primarily the calcium regulating hormone, has some secondary effects on phosphate. And the way PTH is phosphatoric is by down-regulating these channels. Phosphate that's filtered now is unable to be reabsorbed at this site, passes the proximal tubule, ends up in the urine. What we're going to focus more on today sometime on PTH, but more, is on this FGF23, which is the other phosphate-regulating hormone that has a very similar effect. It down-regulates and recycles these channels. Now, what's interesting is, is that the only way out of the body for phosphate is the urine. And yet, as patients lose kidney function, there's very little change in their serum phosphate. They're able to maintain this mean line in the completely normal range until the very bitter end when GFRs are down in the 15 range and we're starting to think about initiating dialysis. In fact, half of patients start dialysis with a normal serum phosphate. And so how is that? And it turns out that there's this incredible adaptation going on in response to reduced kidney function, whereby at around the GFR of 45 to 60, you see this exponential increase in the fractional excretion of phosphorus. And what that means is, the percentage of phosphate that is filtered at the glomerulus that ends up being excreted in the urine goes up dramatically. Such that even though the filtered amount of phosphorus is going way down, you're able to maintain neutral phosphate balance by just augmenting the amount you excrete that was filtered. And the way that's done is right here, by downregulation of these two transporters, which allows more phosphate to pass into the urine. But what was the signal telling the kidney to make this adaptation? 
And for years, it was thought that PTH was the driver because we knew PTH had phosphateric effects. But for reasons I won't get into now, it's in retrospect very clear that it was impossible that PTH was the sole story based on some other evidence. And so to figure this out, we need to pause the kidney part and turn our attention to some ultra rare diseases that are occasionally seen by our colleagues in endocrinology, but more often pediatric endocrinology. And so this is a family of diseases that all fit under the name of hypophosphatemic rickets or osteomalacia. These are all hypophosphatemic disorders that are caused by renal phosphate wasting. And the other interesting aspect of these diseases are that in the setting of renal phosphate wasting and resulting hypophosphatemia, the normal physiological response should be to recruit every compensatory mechanism to bring more phosphate into the system. And one way to do that is to augment production of the activated form of vitamin D, which enhances intestinal absorption of phosphate in addition to calcium. Yet these patients, for some reason, in the setting of profound hypophosphatemia, are not mounting that calcitriol response. They're not activating vitamin D. And so it became clear that there was a circulating factor, by the way, proven to be circulating, based on doing a kidney transplant in somebody like this and the disease recurring immediately. So it wasn't a, an intrinsic kidney problem. This was a pr uh, problem of a circulating factor. And it turned out that this circulating factor is at the same time seemingly suppressing phosphate reabsorption, causing the hypophosphatemia, and at the same time suppressing calcitriol. And for years it was unclear what this was. And a term was coined, phosphatonin. There are circulating phosphatonins that are maintaining phosphate tone that are as yet undiscovered. And so modern genetic tools brought to bear in this ultra-rare disease 20 some odd affected uh, families or individuals from just a handful of families were studied and it turned out that each and every person who has one variation of this, autosomal dominant hypophosphatemic rickets, has a mutation in what turns out to be fibroblast growth factor 23. The last FGF to be found, there's no more to be had, the genome sequence, the, this was it. And so FGF23 is a peptide hormone that is largely secreted by osteocytes, although in recent years it's becoming increasingly clear that the bone marrow stromal cells, where, from where osteocytes are born, are also able and, and might be really important to this iron relationship that we'll talk about later, but it largely comes from the bone. And what does FGF23 do in health? Well, when you eat phosphate in large amounts, your serum phosphate doesn't budge. And the reason why is because a signal is brought to the FGF23 secreting cells. We don't know what that signal is, signal is, mind you. But the FGF23 is made, and it goes to the kidney and signals the kidney to dump phosphate in the urine. At the same time, it suppresses activation of calcitriol. And this is part of a classic negative endocrine feedback loop that spins in the exact opposite direction as the feedback loop shared between vitamin D and PTH. So we know PTH is the main stimulus to turn on renal activation of 125. FGF23 is the main inhibitor. And that balance is what determines 125D status. And so the net result is if you eat a lot of phosphate, you dump a lot in the urine, you become somewhat less efficient at absorbing it from your gut, and your serum phosphate doesn't budge. If you go on a very low phosphate diet, your FGF23 production goes way down. Your kidney becomes very phosphate avid. You hold on to all the filtered phosphate, and you start making more vitamin D. Whatever you are eating, you're going to absorb it at a higher percentage, and the serum phosphate doesn't budge. Now, all of these effects of FGF23 are mediated by its binding to a co-receptor in the kidney called clotho, which is getting a lot of attention. And Eleanor is moving to the clotho capital of the world, and with which I have some professional collegial disputes about how things work. So there's still a lot to, uh, to sort out here, which makes it exciting. But clotho is a hormone that acts as, uh, excuse me, is a, well, it might be a hormone, but it's a, a, a co-receptor that turns typical FGF receptors, which are found in every cell in the body and have relatively low affinity for FGF23, into a highly specific FGF23 receptor. 
And because clotho is primarily found in the kidney, all the effects that we've been speaking about on phosphate and vitamin D of FGF23, those are mediated in the kidney via F, uh, clotho acting as co-receptor. Okay, so very little nephrology so far. We're talking about endocrine hormones. Um, but it turns out that when you look at all the syndromes that have now lined up that have different manifestations of derangements of this FGF23 axis, uh, you find something interesting. So first off, to orient you, this is like a med school review book uh, for the boards where you have a hormone that's either got states of overload in red or states of deficiency in blue. And for each of those cases, you can further categorize, categorize into primary defects where the lesion is in the cell responsible or the gland responsible for making the hormone. Or you can have secondary syndromes where the gland is doing what it's supposed to but it's responding to chronic disease stimuli from elsewhere in the body. And so FGF23 was discovered up here. Rare, mostly hereditary disorders of primary FGF23 excess. There's one that adult physicians might get called to see, and that's a patient with tumor-induced osteomalacia. We're seeing a little bit more of it because it can sometimes be perineoplastic to malignancy. And as people are living longer with wacky malignancies, these are, some of these are sprouting. But nevertheless, it's very, very rare. But I'll just pay your attention to what really got me excited about this. The single most important cause of an elevated FGF23 at the population level is kidney disease. So if, if I gave you 100 patients and I said they all have elevated FGF23 and I picked them off the street, 95 or more of them would have chronic kidney disease. So the beautiful physiology discovered in ultra rare diseases but the ultimate public health relevance might be most important in kidney disease. Turns out heart failure is the other major cause uh, of FGF23 elevation. And we don't yet know whether that's due to renal hypoperfusion and it's co-opting the chronic kidney disease pathway or if it uniquely is doing something on its own. There's some data that suggests it might be doing something on its own via tissue ischemia that's going to come out in the JCI in the next couple of weeks. Um, the other thing about kidney disease is not only is it the most common cause of an elevated FGF23, it's the thing that gives you the most elevated levels. And shown here are a whole bunch of conditions. You don't have to squint in your eyes. These are those primary disorders in which it was discovered. And you're talking about levels that are about 10-fold to 20-fold elevated. But in kidney disease, we've had to cut the y-axis three times to accommodate what you can see in dialysis, where patients can have levels of 100,000. 200,000. So just to, or 20, you know, to 20,000 when they start to elevate. Put that into perspective. Because there's nothing else that I know of that gets elevated to this extent. ETH, not even close to what you see here. It's like having a BUN of 20,000. That's the magnitude of elevation, just to benchmark it for you. So what happens as kidney disease evolves? Well, this is an animal study. Uh, that shows it very nicely. Animals were given anti-glomerular basement membrane antibodies. They were given, you know, almost good pasture disease. And what you can see is that the creatinine is subtly but significantly elevated on day 10 after the kidney injury was introduced, and already at the same time the FGF23 is elevated. So one of the things we've learned is that FGF23 is exquisitely sensitive to kidney injury, and there is a whole other literature on FGF23 and acute renal failure that I'm not going to touch on today. At that day 10 mark, the 125D is unchanged, the PTH is unchanged, and it's only later that the 125D starts to fall, PTH rises, and it's not till still later that you finally start to see elevations in serum phosphate. And so what does this mean? So that's a nice temporal set of data, but whether the authors really came up with something critically important was in this experiment, where they now took those animals with established kidney disease, and they gave them a monoclonal antibody to completely eliminate all FGF23 effect. And the idea was to say, what is FGF23 doing in kidney disease? How are we going to test that? We're going to introduce kidney disease, and then we're going to annihilate all the FGF23 effect and see what happens. And so immediately upon giving the antibodies that neutralize FGF23, the animals develop severe hyperphosphatemia. And the normal animals without CKD were really not that different than the animals with CKD that had FGF23 action. So what does this tell us? It 
the reason why kidney patients, going back to one of the very early slides, are able to maintain a normal serum phosphate despite critical reductions in glomerular filtration rate and thus filtered amount of phosphate is because they make more and more FGF23, which stimulates a higher proportion of the phosphate that's filtered to be excreted. That's actually the B finding. The A finding is right here. The A finding is that when they gave the high-dose antibodies, not only did they elevate, but they fully normalized, that's the normal animals in the dash line, they fully normalized circulating 125D levels. Now, why is this the A finding? This is the A finding because it shows it's something that we taught people in medical school until recently, and hopefully not anymore, is complete nonsense. And that is that the mechanism of calcitriol deficiency is due to insufficient renal mass in chronic kidney disease. That they just don't have enough healthy kidney to make enough 125, and that's why they go on to get calcium problems and secondary hyperparathyroidism. And eh, wrong. Here you have an animal with established CKD, and simply by eliminating the effects of FGF23, all of a sudden the renal mass is sufficient to support production. This is not a can't make vitamin D situation. This is a situation where the kidney is being told not to make it, and the messenger of that signal is FGF23. And so the Discovery of this has really changed our whole understanding of the pathophysiology of disordered mineral metabolism and kidney disease and, and normal regulation of calcium and phosphate homeostasis. So what we now know is that amongst what is easily measured at the moment, an increase in FGF23 is the earliest alteration in mineral metabolism and kidney disease. This is one of the areas where there's some interesting controversy. Is there clotho deficiency that is upstream of this, or is it, you know, as the Dallas group believes, or is there, uh, if it's FGF23 upstream, and clotho is a later phenomenon, which is what uh, we believe. Regardless, once you get the high FGF23, this gradually suppresses calcitriol production by the kidney. And once that threatens calcium homeostasis, there's no other recourse to maintain a normal serum calcium other than more PTH and borrowing calcium from bone under the influences of PTH. And importantly, all of this occurs while the serum phosphate is absolutely normal. So you see a patient in clinic, their calcium's normal, their phosphate's normal, you think their mineral metabolism's normal, but if they have kidney disease, it's almost definitely not the case. In this window, there are patients with high FGF23s, high PTHs, and it's those elevations that are maintaining normal serum levels. Now, that group is super interesting. Why? Because we now have all kinds of data that demonstrate that the higher your FGF23, the higher your risk of death. This is in patients new to dialysis. This is that very population of patients with normal serum phosphate and compensatory elevations of FGF23 with GFRs between 20 to 70 at baseline. And you can see the higher FGF23 on day one, very highly predictive of subsequent risk of death. This is uh, another study from another group in advanced CKD before dialysis. This is from the general population. So a tremendous amount of signals linking this high FGF23 to increased risk of death. So we started with this hint that phosphate was associated with mortality. And now we've got even stronger data implicating alterations in phosphate homeostasis with elevated FGF23 as being part of the problem. What's driving all this? Well, we've done a number of studies looking at specific cardiovascular events and specific causes of death in this population of kidney patients, and there's no signal for atherosclerosis. It's entirely with heart failure, where you see this linear increase in risk no matter how you analyze it. This is in our hands. This is a European study. This is a study. Um, of older individuals in the United States, I forgot the name of the cohort, but not entirely CKD. There's a signal in both CKD and non-CKD. And so what's driving this? What is heart failure and kidney disease? Most heart failure and kidney disease is HEFPEF, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, at least early on. And so these get patients develop pathological left ventricular hypertrophy that ultimately then leads to high filling pressures, there's intramyocardial fibrosis that interferes with normal conduction. Patients are at risk of arrhythmia, lots of AFib, lots of sudden death. In fact, sudden death is the most common cause of cardiovascular death in dialysis, not an acute occlusive MI. 
And so we then, with this signal on heart failure and this very strong link to mortality, we did some deeper looking at FGF23 in the heart. Then we found in a cohort of about 3,000 patients with echoes that the higher your FGF23, the higher your left ventricular mass, and the more likely you were to have concentric or eccentric LVH, variations of HEFPEF uh, in the case of concentric LVH. And Patients who didn't have LVH at baseline had a subsequent echo many years or three years later, and incident LVH was strongly linked to elevated FGF23. And so what was driving all of this, and was this all just a biomarker, or could there be something causal? So back when I was in Miami working with uh, Christian Fallon and Alex Grabner, we did these studies where we treated cardiac myocytes with FGF23 or FGF2. Now, why FGF2? That was our positive control because it's well known that in other states of cardiac injury that then lead to cardiac hypertrophy, that FGF2 is an important molecular mediator of the hypertrophy. And so our hypothesis was that maybe FGF23 co-ops the pathways of one of its cousins and does something similar, particularly when the levels are very, very high in patients with kidney disease. And that's exactly what happened. These normal, small brick-shaped cardiac myocytes turn into these monsters when they're exposed to high levels of FGF23. And I, there's a lot more data in that study, but our, our hypothesis, and I will say that this is still something that is debated, how much of this is a direct effect of FGF23, how much of it is a biomarker of other effects, is it affect salt handling and blood pressure regulation, there's all kinds of stuff out there to do in this field. We don't know everything for sure. What we do know, to summarize, is that whether you have reduced GFR due to kidney disease or heart disease, or whether you habitually consume a high dietary phosphate load, each of those things will tell your bone to make more FGF23. That turns on a series of compensations involving renal phosphate excretion, suppressed 125, and increased PTH that maintain normal serum calcium and phosphate, a very adaptive response. But then over the long haul, as you have unremitting kidney disease, this eventually devolves into perhaps cardiac injury based on this sort of stuff. There's some data on alterations in the system and kidney disease progression, and undoubtedly chronic PTH elevation with bone resorption contributes to the high frac risk that our patients are exposed to. And so one last thing on this FGF23 and the heart stuff, just to show some very nice data from uh, a junior colleague at Duke, Alex Grabner. So he set out to investigate what is the receptor that mediates the cardiac effect of FGF23. And based on some preliminary data, we thought it was FGF receptor 4. This is an FGF receptor 4 global knockout. So limitation is not cardiac specific. We have that working now. But in the meantime, the global knockout fed a normal diet, has this heart. When it's fed a high phosphate diet for several months, you stimulate native production of FGF23, animal gets cardiac hypertrophy, but if it's lacking FGF receptor 4, it's completely protected. And conversely, this is a gain of function mutation in FGFR4 where it's constitutively active. And it's, this was sitting in an oncology lab where they were studying FGFR4 as an oncogene. And it turned out that that alone, constitutive activation, was sufficient to cause cardiac hypertrophy. So with all this badness that we're laying at the doorstep of FGF23, people came along and said, OK, let's just wipe out all the FGF23 effect. If it's so bad, let's just kill it. That's the nephrologist's approach to endocrinology, and it doesn't work. And the reason why is because you need some FGF23. I showed you in the beginning, you need it to maintain normal phosphatemia. The treatment of hyperthyroidism might be just to destroy or remove the thyroid gland, but you don't send the person home without thyroid hormone replacement. So you need some of these hormones, not zero and not too much, and this is no exception. So if you go to zero FGF23, survival goes down, the animal's calcified, they have awful hyperphosphatemia, they get hypercalcemia too because they can't stop the vitamin D. Anyways, that's not the winning approach. So here's your evidence of that. FGF23 null mice, completely predictable. They do exactly what you would expect in that previous experiment. So let me put this together then. Kidney disease, high FGF23 contributes to cardiac injury. Hyperphosphatemia, I blitzed through in the interest of time the last slide. 
targets the vessels and contributes to this calcific disease that is such a huge problem in our patients. And clotho deficiency, perhaps directly at both junctures, all are contributing to developing cardiovascular events. But treatment to wipe out FGF23 and precipitate severe hyperphosphatemia is just going to trade one bad thing for a different one. So we need to develop more nuanced approaches that target all of these alterations. And one approach is perhaps to go upstream to the diet. And so let me just pause and give you some population health type of preaching here. Um, if dietary phosphate is what drives FGF23 production, consuming a high dietary phosphate does, the question then becomes, where does phosphate come in your diet? And so there's a couple of main sources, meat and dairy, plant-based sources, and phosphate-based food additives. And when I say bioavailability, I'm referring to their, the ease with which these are absorbed in the GI tract. And so meat and dairy, about 2 thirds to 3 quarters of the phosphate content, ends up getting absorbed. The plant-based phosphate is very poorly absorbed. Why is that? Because much of the phosphate is found in this very nice molecule called phytic acid. And in order to consume these phosphate groups or to absorb them, you need to cleave them from the central carbon ring, and you need an enzyme called phytase. And the problem is, is that the human genome does not encode phytase. So the only phosphate that we can get out of phytates is when our colonic bacteria do the job for us. But, so it's much lower. But then there's this business, phosphate-based food additives. The gifts of the United States food industry to the population, and largely not to the population that can stroll around in Whole Foods uh, picking up the healthiest stuff. Now, mind you, for all the people who go to Whole Foods, I think the joke's on us, too, because this stuff is pervasive, even in you know what's said to be organic and fancy, et cetera. I'm not so sure. But here's the experiment we did. We're, it's part of a study where we're trying to manipulate the diet and remove phosphate-based additives from kidney patients and see what happens to their FGF23. But we had to create the diet. And so we started with the fresh diets, and we made an isocaloric version using all processed foods where we could as substitutes. And then we sent it to the lab where they blow it up and ash it, and that's how you measure the micronutrient content, and this is what you're looking at. You're looking at a 50% higher amount of phosphate by eating this kind of diet. So just for the nephrologists in the room who take care of patients on dialysis, persistent hyperphosphatemia, that's impossible. You know, particularly if they're a low resource uh, type of uh, social situation, these patients don't have a chance. They have to eat the foods that are cheap, are loaded up with phosphate, and it's not a coincidence. Loading it with phosphate is part of what makes it cheap, and they're unbeknownst to them consuming enormous amounts of phosphate that no phosphate binder can manage. And just to show you how this plays out, this is our hypothesis that I just laid out, that you have the built environment being such that certain people in the population are disproportionately eating processed foods that solicit this FGF23 response that we think contributes to cardiac injury when exacerbated by kidney disease, which is enormously common in people of low socioeconomic status, you get cardiac injury. And we think that this might be a modifiable mechanism of disparity, particularly in heart failure, uh, that run in socioeconomic lines and racial lines. And just to show this very nicely, this is a study, this is one of my favorite studies. It got published in a very obscure kidney journal. Um, it was suggested by somebody in the audience when I was giving a talk like this who was doing something called the tricontinent study to look at the effect of westernization on hypertension. So people go from places where they don't eat salt to the US where they're exposed to an enormous amount of salt. What happens to their blood pressure? That was the, and you can imagine, it goes up. But she said, oh, we, why don't we do this with phosphate? And it was a great idea. And so these are people from urban Chicago of African ancestry. They have very high urinary phosphate excretion, which is your surrogate of net phosphate absorption. So meaning these guys are on high phosphate diets. And as a result, they have FGF23s up here. And these are people of African ancestry living in rural Africa. And I think about half of them had undetectable FGF23s. 
and they had extremely low urinary phosphate excretion. So it's super interesting, this idea that the United States food industry might be killing poor people by phosphate-based additives is something that I think we uh, should work on. So back to the patient with the fracture times two over a month with the osteomalacia. So it turned out that these guys in Europe uh, from the IBD clinic found some obscure paper in the Journal of Bone and Mineral Research that said that the drug that this guy was getting called ferric carboxymaltose for his ongoing iron losses, his IV iron, was associated with hypophosphatemia. And this patient's serum phosphate at the index hospitalization for the first fracture was less than one milligram per deciliter. In fact, they had the serum phosphate there, just nobody could put any of it together. And I don't blame them. It's not, you know, what, a, what, what one specialist does versus what another does. I mean, this is one of the costs of fragmentation of care. So there was a small study we did in JBMR where we showed this effect of hypophosphatemia. But let me show you now two studies, one that came out a year ago and one that came out last week. And the first time I'll present the second one. And so this was called the FIRM trial. And it was a 2,000 patient study of patients requiring intravenous iron for treatment of iron deficiency anemia. Why did they need IV? Either they failed or they didn't tolerate oral. And so they either got randomized to ferromoxetol or to ferrocarboxymaltose. Now these are these new fancy irons. What's so great about them? The reason why they've been developed is because they can be given in one or two sittings and completely correct iron deficiency versus Oral iron, which a lot of patients don't tolerate and can take months and months to even decide that it has failed. And so this is a sure thing. It always works. But the one or two seating with rapid infusion has really been the real revolution because now you can do it to outpatient, you can give it to outpatients without it being too much of a hassle. So within this uh, large study, we also did a sub-study where we looked at more detailed physiological parameters. And we just they got their iron on according to FDA approved protocols on day zero, a week later, and we measured things out for a couple of weeks. And in orange are the ferrocarboxymaltose patients, and blue are ferromoxetol. These are stacked bar graphs. So at time zero, 100% of the patients had serum phosphates that were above two. A week later, 20%. A week later, close to 50% of the ferrocarboxymaltose patients slipped into the hypophosphatemia range. And at week five, when we stopped the study and weren't looking anymore, there was still about 30% of patients that were hypophosphatemic. And like we showed in our small 20 or 40 patient uh, pilot study in the JBMR many years ago, we re replicated here, giving this drug acutely increases FGF23. And this is the mechanism of the hypophosphatemia. And so we recently moved on. This one came out literally last week in JAMA. And I, it was uh, driving and driving to get this out to a general medical journal because it's critical. Because I believe patients are getting harmed by receiving this drug. And the only people who know about the phosphate business or who really think about it at all are nephrologists and endocrinologists. Endocrinologists never give IV iron. So this was like, when I found an endocrinologist and showed them to this, they were like, oh my god, I've never seen this. This is amazing. Nephrologists give tons of IV iron, but we give it to people on dialysis who can't renal phosphate waste, so we don't see this either too much. Now, who does give IV iron to people with intact kidney function who can get this syndrome? GI, hematology, OB. These are people who walk around thinking about FGF23 and phosphate homeostasis. And so this fragmentation is meaning that patients are slipping through the cracks. People are given the iron. Patients getting sick with hypophosphatemia, they don't feel right. Nobody even knows to look. So we need to get this out to the General Medical Journal, and finally we've achieved that. So this is a study I did with a company that has a new one of these one-and-done IV irons. But we did these two trials as part of their efforts to get FDA approved. And it's either ferrocarboxymaltose, which is this one that keeps causing hypophosphatemia, compared to this other company's new drug. And I did consult with them, full transparency in, in this project. Uh, and this is called iron isomaltosides. It's abbreviated IIM. And we collected blood and urine and the whole house special multiple times over the first 35 days. 
I'm not going to go through the concert diagram, but just rest assured, across the two trials, we had 125 patients in one arm and 117 in the other. And we had a very high number of patients who were able to complete the study. And so here's the primary outcome is right here. Incidence of hypophosphatemia at any time during the study. 75% hypophosphatemia after ferricarboxymaltose. And here's the prevalence at each of the time points. So it peaks on day 14. But still, at day 35, you've got 40 plus percent of patients. My biggest regret with all these studies is that we haven't gone out to see how long it takes until it remits and goes away fully. You could argue that maybe a little bit of hypophosphatemia for a week or two may be OK. But if you start showing me, and people are now emailing me over the last few years, there's a guy in Boston who got one dose of this drug, and a year later, he still got refractory hypophosphatemia. This is what happened to that patient with the fractures. So what's going on? So blue is ferrocarboxymaltose. Orange is the comparator iron isomaltoside. One day after getting ferrocarboxymaltose, the, there's an increase in 100 points uh, delta. These are all changed from baseline. By day eight, after they get the second half of the dose, their FGF23 level has changed by 300, uh, you know, 300 uh, picograms per ml. Serum phosphate drops. The nadir, on average, is 1.5 milligrams per deciliter. So you start at normal at 3.2. That means your average is 1.7. That means you've got plenty of people at one. What's causing this? Renal phosphate wasting mediated by this guy. What happens to vitamin D? Well, we know that a downstream effect of FGF23 is to suppress renal activation of 125. And indeed, the 125D levels tank, severely tank. I think the patients, some of the symptoms might relate to this. Now, a lot of people like to say, oh, this is, this is, you know, we see this in people with IBD a lot, and they have fat malabsorption, so it's due to vitamin D deficiency, and all this hand waving to try to exculpate the drug, which is the entire problem. And it, here we show that there's absolutely no effect on 25D levels, which is the way you assess vitamin D stores. Fascinatingly, and why I think I finally was able to get one of these reports into JAMA, was it went to the endocrinology editor, and we made a big deal out of this finding. This is the first human evidence. This is really obscure, nerdy FGF23 vitamin D stuff. But it's the first human evidence to show that not only does FGF23 suppress production of 125, but that its known effect to accelerate FG, uh, 125D degradation is actually of clinical relevance. And that's shown here. You see this increase in one of the uh, catabolic enzymes of uh, um, byproducts of vitamin D degradation that's acutely elevated by FGF23. So what happens when your calcium goes, excuse me, when your 125D goes down? Well, now your calcium absorption is jeopardized, and you get subtle, but really you would never notice that changes in serum calcium. So does that mean this is nothing to worry about? I don't know. Because the reason why the serum calcium is kept pretty good is because the PTH is going off the wall. And so you're able to maintain normal calcemia because of secondary hyperparathyroidism, but this too is not good for your bone. And here is exactly what happens to the bone, even after this one course. This is also for the first time shown that there is a change in bone turnover markers in the pattern that you see with osteomalacia. Now, just a few comments on this PTH business. Remember, we started by saying PTH also phosphatoric in addition to regulating calcium. And so these patients get this drug. For the first few weeks, they have a massive increase in FGF23, stimulates renal phosphate wasting, and sets a cascade of events that includes 125D deficiency that ultimately results in secondary hyperpara. And so now they spend the next three weeks and beyond, the PTH is still going up, with elevation of another phosphatoric hormone. And so the phosphate wasting goes on. And in one month, you can re recapitulate what we believe is the pathogenesis of secondary hyperparathyroidism and kidney disease. It usually takes a year or more to evolve. You have this drug, FGF goes up, 125 goes down, PTH comes up. So to summarize, uh, let's skip bullet one, which was, would be too overwhelming because it's even more complicated. Uh, all these IV irons 
Uh, uh, so Mr. Uh, the family of Jeff Nutz here to celebrate your father's 85th birthday. One of his family kills the family you're suggesting. Under a um, and think about it. What's the symptoms of hypophosphatemia? It's not feeling great. You can't put your finger on it. It's like the non specific symptoms. Who's getting IV iron? People with the anemia. The controversial comments have anemia in and of itself that does discussed how black students and the disease that gave them anemia are just proportionally punished very compared to students of other races. What's that all about? Their Foster Americans are only 37% of the population. So people give them more ideas. Their best protein should they only be assume it's related to the anemia. So, Duncan says she uh, used the example that all parts showed up. Everything is done. She only uploaded each group saying it's deeper than just the. I need to understand how long it takes to be hypophosphatic. How long is it safe to be hypophosphatic? Is the number greater than zero weeks that's safe, or should we just not use this drug altogether? And we really need to be careful in the IV clinic. And the people who require recurrent, very racially insensitive, if not racist, global urban leaks, president and CEO, and the people who are in the sense of the patient, the people who are in the same part, Comments and attitude are not representative of the desiring to embrace, educate, and empower student body as diverse as Jesus is. Every puzzle got the reaction. I don't have any intent of resigning because of what I say. I did not say that. As for her comments, Duncan tells me she stands by what she said and has no regrets. She says that. He's the victim in this situation. Um, I, I was uh, offended and bullied, and I still feel that they're that I'm being. WLKY news. Duncan tells WLKY she will not bring this matter up at the next board meeting. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. It's it's so first of all, the hypopara is that what the example? Yeah, that's a great example. So hypopara is fascinating um, and teaches us something completely different about the physiology. There's there's a gatekeeper effect on FGF23 of probably 125 and calcium, and meaning so so when you're hypopara. I remember when this first got discovered, and Eduardo Sladopolsky would get up and ask this question every time. And I'd answered it to him. He'd asked it to me in person, but he liked to do it for the room. He would ask me every time, oh, if this FGF23 is so important, he was a PTH guy, if this FGF23 is so important, how come you're hyperphosphatemic and hypopara? Why doesn't the FGF23 come to the rescue and fix it? And the answer is, is in the setting of hypocalcemia and critical calcitriol deficiency, which is exactly what you get with hypopara, the FGF23 effect is blunted. It doesn't work. And teleologically, it makes sense. If you're hypocalcemic, you don't want to be making more FGF23 that's going to suppress 125 and potentially worsen uh, the calcium even further. So there's a paper from like the 1960s in the JCI where they gave intravenous calcium to patients with primary hypopara and instantaneously, their renal phosphate excretion went off the wall. Now, they didn't know what FGF23 was then, but by correcting the calcium, they probably released that, that clamp. Subsequently, hypoparathyroidism at the NIH, the big group that does the studies, gave calcitriol and showed that the, that dose of calcitriol, acutely flipped the FGF23 rockets up to phosphate normalizers. So I think the calcium is still king. If the calcium is jeopardized, all these other secondary systems to control phosphate are not functioning normally. And so I think hypopara has got some complexities for there. IBD is very hard to dissociate because uh, there's so much inflammation, which also has independent effects on FGF23 regulation. So it's a little bit of a challenging, messy area. Which one? Well, then it first clunky, because that's 
200 for, you give injected first? You got this problem then, I promise you. Injectifer is FCM. Well, why does it do it? Yeah, so, so we think it's the sugar carrier, um, and we don't know why. That's one of the big questions. Um, but ferromoxetol does not do it. Iron sucrose vinifer, I mean, almost never. Um, this iron isomaltoside is less than 10%. But interestingly, iron isomaltoside, it's got, whenever it's got maltose in the name, there's a flavor to it. You get a little bit of this. Ferric carboxymaltose is by far the biggest offender. If you give it to somebody with normal kidney function, there's a two in three to three in four chance they're gonna get hypophosphatemic at two weeks. Um, and I would be really worried about giving it again. So if you've give if you you know what you might find if you want to change is that your hospital has signed a very nice contract and has a mountain of the stuff and they're going to say no and then they start rolling out well transient is the hypophosphatemia so bad that this this is this is what happens so if you're stuck with it what I would say is for the people who are going to be one and done I think okay you can you know know about it if you have to give it give it but then watch it on the back end. For patients who need to get recurrent IV iron, I would not give this drug. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Imagine trying to fill this cup of coffee if it had a hole in the bottom. The renal phosphate leak is a nightmare to manage. And whenever you have re when renal fill in the blank leak is a nightmare to manage. Hypoparathyroidism, where you have a calcium leak. And if you try to win, you try to give enough calcium to a hypopara or enough phosphate to this guys, what are you going to get? It, you get enough calcinosis. It goes through and it gets excreted in the kidney, except for the stuff that deposits in, the, in all the tubules and causes uh, inflammation. So it's really not a winning strategy. Um, you want to give 125D? It's a nice idea, except the feedback loop means you're turning on the FGF23 more. There is no good treatment for this. You just got to put on your seatbelt and ride it out. Really, the treatment is primary prevention and use something else. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. You asked, so uh, oh. um, it's a long, it's a, it's a complicated story. It's really fascinating. The, the whole origin of knowing anything about any of this is the fact that Harold Buchner developed an assay for FGF23 that had two epitopes in the C terminus, so that when the molecule gets cleaved, the C terminal fragments can be grabbed and captured by the assay, but so can the full length molecule. So the C-terminal assay is kind of a misnomer, but if you understand, it's full length plus fragment. When people are iron deficient, they transcribe an enormous amount of FGF23, and then they immediately cleave it. And so if you measure at base, both transcribe, translate, and then cleave newly formed peptide. It's the only endocrine gland I know of that goes through the hassle of making its hormone only to turn around and intracellularly degrade it. And it's done in the setting of iron deficiency. They're not that long, but they entered the circulation. And everybody always thought, oh, they're just a nuisance. Um, and really, we, if we just had a better assay. So then the intact assay came along. And so what you can see in patients with iron deficiency, untreated, uh, is that they have very high C-terminal levels and stone cold normal intact FGF23, and as a result, this is the biologically active. They have completely normal phosphate on their stasis. There's no phenotype of phosphate in, in untreated iron deficiency. But they have this engine that is turned on to make and degrade, make and degrade FGF23, and the footprint of that are all these fragments in circulation that this one assay that we just happen to have by accident picks up. So why is the cell going through this 
huge energy inefficient hassle of making something like turnaround graded. So we are certain that those C terminal fragments are having local effects on erythropoiesis and are involved in iron homeostasis. This is not just some accident. It's almost like an, a, a different way of alternatively splicing. Instead of doing it at the gene level, you're doing it at the translated level. So what's crazy about this ferrocarboxymaltose business is you gave, we, when we did the first study, I mean, this is a, long, a little bit of a long answer, but when we did the first study in the JBMR, we took these young, healthy women who had heavy menstrual bleeding. They were severely iron deficient. It's C-terminal FGF23 levels at baseline like somebody on dialysis, but their intact was completely normal. We gave them the ferrocarboxymaltose. We had 50 plus percent hypophosphatemic. We went and measured the FGF23, and the C-terminal went down by 80%. And we're like, what? So we proved that we could shut off that transcription translation cleavage churn by restoring iron sufficiency, but we couldn't figure out why, how they got hypophosphatemic when the FGF23 was going down. So the only time I was ever successful in my entire life of convincing a company to put blood samples in a freezer was that time. And I said, this has to be FGF23. Let's go do the other assay. And this is before all this business about the iron was known. We did the other assay, and lo and behold, in the setting of the C-terminal going down by 80%, the intact was going up fivefold. Voila, there's the answer. So we think there's two steps in regulation, or maybe three. There's transcription, there's post-translational modification that earmarks it for cleavage or secretion, and then there's cleavage. And we think that the carboxymaltose is somehow interfering with one of those second steps. So in the setting of the high transcription state of iron deficiency, now you interfere with that degradation product. You're making tons of FGF23 and cleaving it. If you just decrease that by a little bit, boom, you're going to have a massive outflow of folate peptide that can cause hypophosphatemia. But that's just a hypothesis. Yeah, John. So I think the trick here for therapeutics and, and drugging this system is this issue, it, it, the, the FGF23 elevation, a chunk of it is appropriate and compensatory for phosphate homeostasis. So if you do something nonspecific that clubs that, if you're given the antibody, and you, so it's possible that if you can understand this cleavage mechanism, that you might be able to cleave more and inactivate. I mean, there's all kinds of ideas you could come up with. But whether that would be wise, I'm not 100% sure. Um, because you would, in effect, it would be like treating hyperthyroidism with something, well, a bad example. Anyways, what, what, what I was going to say, was, uh, an alternative approach would be to go after the pathways that FGF23 activates that you want to block without sacrificing the ones that you want to maintain. So you want to maintain the phosphate homeostasis regulation, but you'd like to block these cardiac effects. And so this finding that FGF receptor 4 might be the mediator of that effect, whereas we know R1 is predominant in the kidney, that gives you some branch point there where maybe you can target R4. problem is R4 is a receptor tyrosine kinase, and they're a nightmare to, to block because, you know, it's like the VEGF receptor antagonists, you know, for renal cell cancer. They block, you know, 15 other things. So that's where we're at. So I, I think the idea would be to find something on the cardiovascular pathway that's distinct from the renal pathway and see if you can target that with some specificity. Great. Thanks. Oh, ah, for the fellows. I can, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can, yeah that's, uh, this is good because. Wow, I'm sure Mike knows that. Yeah. Just read, keep your eyes in the newspaper. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, when you're. Thank you. Yeah, this is great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is heavy. Oh, my God. Like Babe Ruth's bet.